we are about to enter into our pitch fest. And there's been some pit, uh, big changes. So how many of you were here last year to hear Daniela Poppy Thornton's ideas and her making the case for systems mapping? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, uh, her message rang clear. And uh, when early stage social entrepreneurs uh, compete with each other for the best new ideas, they might miss important parts of the big picture. And, uh, and uh, oftentimes when we do that, their individual solutions, it struggles. It doesn't really take root. Um, and so the other side of that is when early stage social entrepreneurs understand the context of the issue they're addressing, they have a better chance, as we saw here, of identifying a lasting, scalable solution. So we're pleased to uh, welcome you to the uh, results of a year of pondering and toiling and planning uh, to lead to a big change. Uh, a, a lot of these ideas were um, coached. We, we got some coaching from the Oxford Center for Social Entrepreneurship. Oh my gosh. Sorry, I have to tell this story real briefly. We were, uh, we were in San Diego. It was the Change Maker Conference, and we were hearing from some of the leaders from the Oxford Center for Social Entrepreneurship, and they threw out the word neocolonialism over at this conference. How many of you have, is it? Weird word, right? And I was saying, oh my, these people are talking about language over here. And there was, but part of the, uh, what one of the ideas that they're really, really grappling with over there, and we are too as well, we're joining them, is the idea that we can't just parachute in. We can't, we can't have that mindset. These aren't leading to the kinds of changes that communities are actually wanting and leading to a thriving situations. So anyways, I have to tell that story. They're wonderful people. And so here's what you're about to experience. There will be three finalists. Three finalists will be pre presenting a social issue that they've explored, they've probed, they've researched, They've identified connecting elements, existing organizations, and solutions that already surround it, right? And in some cases, maybe some gaps between those solutions where potential innovations could thrive. So we're not looking to them to present solutions. We're evaluating their pitches for the insights that they have unearthed. Um, and so their ability to take a broad perspective of the system, that's what we're looking for. Um, and you can find more about the criteria in your program. So take a look at your program. You can find the criteria for our finalists. Because you get to vote. You get to vote. OK, that's also a new change. OK. Um, the mechanics of this session will go like this. The finalists will each get six minutes to present their system apps. After each six-minute pitch, the finalists will get some questions from uh, educators, entrepreneurs, experts. These are our Pitch Fest advisors. And uh, finally, the Pitch Fest will culminate in a short debrief, a reflection on what it is that we heard. And then you get to vote. Your uh, instructions will be coming soon. Um, uh, let's see, what else? OK, voting instructions will be on the large screen behind me after we hear from the pitches. And so don't worry, I will re review them with you. Um, and I'm, I, I should remind or mention, voting is limited only to those here at the Armory, so don't go tweet out who you want to for people to vote. Don't send it to your mom, OK? Uh, only one vote per attendee, and no outside votes for duplicates. So the winner of the pitch fest, the prizes, will be announced in the lobby at this afternoon's reception at 3.30 p.m. So, our panelists, can we come on stage? Um, we have Dominic Varakali, uh, founding partner of Kickstand. These are our Pitch Fest advisors. Dominic Varakali, can we give them a round of applause? Uh, we have Lola Milholland, co-founder and CEO of Umi Organic. and Aaron Kenzie, Instructor of System Science at VSU. And so while they're, uh, while they're setting up, um, we will welcome our first finalist, Valerie Armstrong.
So, as I stand before you today, there are 22,000 adults incarcerated in Oregon. And most of them will be getting out. Could be today, could be 30 years from now. My name is Valerie Armstrong. I'm a designer, and today I'm going to, speaking, I'm going to be speaking with you about the cycle of crime, its causes, and some potential opportunities for intervention. For the past six months, I've been volunteering with a nonprofit called OHAM, which runs arts and dialogue programs at Oregon prisons. And through this experience, I've been learning a lot about the criminal justice system, including that 50% of people who get released from prison are going to reoffend within three years of their release. So our recidivism rate is 50%. That's much too high. And a theme that I found behind this is that the people who commit multiple crimes have unmet needs. They're often unhealthy with either mental or physical issues. They come from low-income families. They have a poor education and perhaps come from difficult childhoods. And all this together makes it difficult to get a good job to take care of themselves and their families. It's a perpetuating cycle, and many turn to crime because the other systems have failed them. For many, prison or incarceration is the end of the line. Once in prison, inmates live in stasis without gaining the necessary skills to change as the rest of the world moves forward. Most people with multiple arrests are arrested for nonviolent crimes. And the systems, the policing system and the prison system, are actually designed for keeping communities safe from violent crimes. But both violent and nonviolent criminals are treated the same way in prisons and jails, essentially. They have very routine, boring days, they're under constant surveillance, and they have very limited resources like books or access to the internet. And you would think that the release date would come as a relief to inmates. But many people say that this is actually when the true punishment begins. That was shocking for me to hear. In fact, many people become suicidal a few months before their release as they realize all the things that they're going to have to do when they get out and the potential barriers along the way. Part of these barriers come from the negative mental models that the public has against inmates and returned citizens. If you've ever met somebody with a criminal record, you might have some preconceived notions about them. That they're dangerous, dishonest, unmotivated, unintelligent. These biases, along with the fact that when people get out, they have virtually nothing to their name, often not even a valid ID, again makes it very hard to get out of prison get a job with a living wage, find housing, necessary medications, and to support a family. This all seems like a lot, and it is. But there's also a lot that we can do. Beginning with shifting the mental models of the public to rehumanize inmates and returned citizens in the eyes of the public. People need to realize that it is possible to turn a life around even after making a devastating mistake, but people need help. Once people's needs are met, we'll all have a safer community. There'll be a reduction in houselessness, more people would, will contribute to the local economy and to be able to support their families, effectively slowing down the cycle of crime and giving hope to the next generation. The second thing we need to do is to encourage policy changes and shift the correctional system to one that corrects and rehabilitates instead of punishes and demeans. And we can look to Sweden and Germany as examples of places that are doing a good job with this. They have some of the lowest crime rates in the world. And part of this has to do with the fact that they treat their inmates humanely. For example, adults in custody in Sweden are able to connect with their families whenever they want. In the United States, by contrast, we're increasingly charging inmates to have video conferences with their families instead of being able to meet with them in person. We have pilot tests happening in the United States to create more human conditions, but 
We need more pressure through voting in order to scale these programs more quickly. And as the wheels of bureaucracy churn on, there are things that we in this room can do as well. Like increase the amount of volunteers in prisons and jails with organizations like OHAM and Mercy Corps. OHAM brings ukulele lessons, writing workshops, and theater productions to prisons. And when inmates are able to have this creative outlet that they've maybe not tapped into before, we found that the effects are really life-changing and transformative. What I'm really excited about is to be able to activate this community of people who are doing work with this often discarded population and increase the impact through collaboration. If you're interested in volunteering in prisons or do work with this population, please find me at any time during this summit or get in touch with me later. I would love to talk about opportunities to improve this very improvable problem. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. Um, uh, oh, wait, should I, we invite uh, Valerie back or so questions, right? So we're doing some questions. Abby, is that correct? Yeah, uh, Valerie, can we come back? <laughs> You're like, get me out of here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hi, sorry. Hi, thank you so much for this talk. Um, I'm really interested in uh, I was wondering if you could say a bit more about, uh, you talked about leverage at a few different levels. Can you say a bit about how those different points might, um, different solutions at different levels might work together, um, especially for uh, sustainability over the long term? Like how could these points work together to really not just change the system, but keep it going in the right direction? Sure. So in order to make transformational change, it's really important to start with shifting the mental models. So if we think of a pyramid, that public perception is really important. If we can get more people in, interested in this issue, then they'll raise the issue with the government and be able to make in, influence changes at a policy level. So first you get the people to care, then the government will care. Um, and they'll be able to make some important changes, not just to the prison system, but it's all very connected. Like education is a huge part of it, healthcare is a huge part of it. Um, and then you start getting up to that top of the pyramid of being able to meet those needs of the individual. And then it kind of cycles back down because once we meet those needs of the individual, it is really relevant to all of us because it makes a safer community for all of us. Um, I'm curious about the um, actors and the ecosystem of organizations that you think would most affect that bottom foundation of your pyramid, the, the public um, perception yeah, of it. That's a really great question. Um, so I think that it is important to get the existing like existing people in the space together. So services like OHAM, but also universities and um, hospitals, bringing all the stakeholders together to come up with solutions to, de to make that transition to civilian life a little bit smoother and to be able to bring programs more to rural areas where there aren't as many. Let's give a round of applause. Hopefully you're taking copious notes for your voting. Very important. Uh, thank you, Valerie. Next up is Henry Burst. And give him a round of applause. Henry Burst. Yeah. What is the difference between an anxiety disorder and another chronic illness like, say, diabetes. Not as much as you may assume. Both manifest themselves physically as well as emotionally and impact a person's daily quality of life. And both have an economic impact. Diabetes, for instance, has a global economic impact of nine and a half billion dollars a year. That's comprised of variables that include a lack of treatment. That means decreased productivity, missed work, and premature death. Mental illness, on the other hand, has a global economic impact of over $10 trillion. 
My name is Henry, and today I'll be mapping the system of the mental health crisis. Depression is one of the leading causes of disability worldwide. So it is no coincidence that I myself have lived it. I've always been close with mental health, whether it's in my family, my close friends, my coworkers, and my significant other. However, it's through my experience coping with mental illness that has led me here today. But the fact of the matter is, mental health affects us all. Now let's take a look at the system. On the top of the iceberg, we can observe that a lot of people experience mental disorders. One in every four people on the planet will be diagnosed at some point in their life, and double that amount in the US. Now, let's take a look at the underlying causes. First off, there's a gap in treatment. On average, there's 11 years by the time a patient is diagnosed to when they receive treatment. Last year, only about 40% of adults diagnosed received treatment, and those with a serious diagnosis, like schizophrenia, only about two-thirds. Overall, in this country, 60% of counties do not have a single psychiatrist. It's a massive gap in access and treatment nationwide. Now let's take a look at the structure. We see isolation, insufficient policy, and an over-reliance on emergency care. First, the isolated. 20% of the houseless community experience a severe mental illness. 25% of adults diagnosed in this country have zero access to health insurance. It's a major gap in political policy. And in the criminal justice system, 70% of youth incarcerated experience mental disease, and 37% of adults. And finally, Mood disorders are the leading cause of hospitalization. One out of every eight visit to the emergency room is related to mental health. Now what's informing all this? What's in our minds? A stigma. A stigma against those with mental disorders. Cambridge recently did a study that directly linked that the level of stigma against mental illness negatively affected the amount of care sought after. And there's two types of stigma. A personal stigma, which is experienced by an individual, and societal stigma, which is external, informed by all of this, and it's in our culture. Now let's take a look at the current market solutions and where are the gaps. We're going to start here, down in the bottom of our model, with the stigma. One of our best tools in combating societal stigma is through pop culture. TV shows that recognize characters with mental illnesses, like 13 Reasons Why, or This Is Us, and music, like Logic's 1-800-Suicide-Hotline song, which went quintuple platinum and was a top three billboard chart. These cultural leaders are making great positive steps, but this is a titanic issue to turn. And the structure informed by this has also made an impact. With the growth of houseless outreach programs and the closure of asylums, the market is changing for the better. However, these great organizations are limited in scope. Often, to local impact and local funding, they alone cannot solve this issue. With treatment, the healthcare community has offered a lot of solutions. However, hiring on a specialist or adhering to a pharmacological treatment can be costly and a huge barrier. Today, we are steeped in the digital age. Apps on our phones are a great way to communicate and share information. Apps like Calm and Headspace offer meditations for people to decrease their mental distress. My team and I are developing a smartwatch application that will monitor your biometrics as well as serve as a digital journal to track how you're feeling. With a product like this, we can increase awareness, improve a person's mental wellness, and decrease the stigma in order to encourage additional care. I believe at this critical level of the mental health crisis, we can change lives, and I believe that we can make a difference. Thank you. exploring some of the systems uh, that um, you know, affect people, 
in this world. What is uh, one of the biggest barriers to entry or finding uh, help or solutions that you discovered? Yeah, in my experience and my research, I think the largest obstacle or barrier in getting care is that stigma. Whether it comes from yourself and you are embarrassed that you are struggling mentally, um, or just finding the resources can just be hard in and of it, itself. Um, I'm curious uh, what your thoughts are on how the stigma of mental illness came into place. Like, what's underlying that stigma? Yeah, absolutely. I think that a lot of people uh, see people struggling with a disease like uh, diabetes, where it has physical um, signs to it. And often things like depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, they don't really show themselves as physically. So you have to kind of convince people that you're hurting and you're not feeling that great. So I think that that's a major obstacle and it's one of the causes of the stigma. I'm curious about um, who you think the organizations or other you know, actors and partners are that would really be um, the greatest sources of connection in that space where you're interested, which is kind of apps, how to get that information to more people, who are your partners in that space? Yeah, absolutely. I think that education is the most important part of awareness. Um, you know, those meditation apps, like I mentioned, with Headspace and Calm, those are great and potential partners. My app would focus on, you know, having you know how you're feeling and be aware that mindfulness is really critical, but also having interventions. So having partners that offer doing a yoga session or having a brief meditation or adjusting your diet, all of those will be potential partnerships. Thank you. Taking notes, right? Taking notes. All right. Can now can we please welcome Carrie Sturrock? <laughs> when we talk about refugees, we're not talking about all immigrants. We're talking about people fleeing persecution. Jewish people fleeing the Holocaust were some of the nation's first refugees. The U.S. refugee resettlement system started after World War II and became stronger with the Watershed Refugee Act of 1980, which standardized the way we resettle refugees in the U.S. Today, there are 70 million people forcibly displaced worldwide, the largest number since World War II. Of these, 26 million are refugees. This crisis will only grow as climate change shifts resources. And yet, the U.S. has dramatically reduced the number of refugees it admits. In 2016, we admitted 85,000. Last year, 30,000. This year, it will be a mere 18,000. At the same time, the U.S. is facing a severe labor shortage. Nationally, there are 7.5 million unfilled positions, with 10,000 people retiring every day. The next generation is not filling those vacancies at nearly the same rate. Drug test failures, the highest they've been since 2004. Even if every disaffected American worker got a job, there would still be 1.3 million unfilled positions. So you can see, letting in even 85,000 refugees is just a drop in the bucket. There are more than enough jobs. But beyond that, refugees make dedicated, hardworking employees and contribute to the economy. According to the New American Economy, refugees open businesses at one and a half times the rate of the native-born population. In 2015, these refugee-owned businesses generated $4.6 billion in income. Refugees pay back $21,000 more in taxes than they receive in benefits in their first 20 years in the U.S. During the 2016 presidential campaign, there was a lot of negative talk about refugees that didn't describe at all my hardworking colleagues at Indo from Burma and Iraq who are some of the company's most valued employees. Nonprofits and religious institutions have long advocated for refugees, but businesses, which hold a lot of sway with lawmakers, have been silent. We Hire Refugees gather small and medium-sized businesses together to declare that refugees make our companies, our state economies, and our communities stronger, and to advocate for legislation and initiatives that support the refugee resettlement infrastructure. 
the heart of the refugee resettlement ecosystem are nine resettlement agencies that staff field offices in every state except Wyoming. These nonprofit organizations and other service providers greet refugees arriving at the airport and help them find housing and jobs. They're funded on a per-refugee basis by the U.S. State Department and the Department of Health and Human Services. As the number of refugees to the U.S. decreases, so too has the funding, and the system is starting to crumble. Since 2017, more than one-third of the 325 resettlement offices have closed their doors. If this ecosystem goes away, it will be almost impossible to rebuild. One of the gaps in this flawed funding system is a lack of state support. Very few states financially support refugee resettlement, even though refugees strengthen businesses and communities. This needs to change. If states don't engage, they're going to pay a price. Oregon's actions can serve as a model. Last year, Oregon's resettlement agencies asked We Hire Refugee Businesses to help support House Bill 2508, which supplied $2 million in temporary state funding for refugee resettlement. When businesses speak, lawmakers listen. House Bill 2508 passed with overwhelming bipartisan support. State support is essential. If this can be replicated in other states, it can help preserve the refugee resettlement ecosystem so we can continue to resettle refugees into the future. There are a lot of nonprofits that deeply care about refugees. Upwardly Global helps highly skilled immigrants and refugees get jobs. The New American Economy researches how immigrants and refugees benefit the, new, the, the U.S. economy. TENT encourages multinational corporations to hire refugees in other countries. No one is asking small and medium-sized businesses to sign a declaration in support of refugees. We Hire Refugees has a narrowly defined goal to build coalitions of small and medium-sized businesses to advocate for legislation and initiatives at the state level to support refugee resettlement. This bridges a huge gap in the current financial support system. The need to strengthen relationships between refugees, nonprofits, and businesses is clear. Recently, two large nonprofits in the refugee space asked We Hire Refugees for help. Could we ask our businesses to sign a letter to the Department of Homeland Security opposing a rule change that would make it difficult for asylum seekers to work while they're waiting to hear if they get refugee status? We hear they have hundreds of businesses already signed on. They didn't. They had less than 10. <coughs> of the businesses that ultimately signed the letter, 40% came through We Hire Refugees. Nonprofits and businesses need to strengthen their relationship, and We Hire Refugees can help in order to pass legislation and initiatives that support refugee resettlement, thereby strengthening businesses and state economies. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can you say a bit about the underlying factors that got us to where we are with refugees and how um, this collaboration building that you're talking about addresses those, those drivers? Um, well, up until now, refugee resettlement has, has been funded at the federal level. And, um, and historically, refugee resettlement has is been is a bipartisan issue. Um, Ronald Reagan was very much behind refugee resettlement. And, um, and so it, it's had this, this funding mechanism that, that is, has not been varied and has just been kind of the sole pipeline from the federal government. And now that um, we're letting in so few refugees and the funding is tied to that, there's, there's, there's nothing to step in and, and fill that, that gap. And it needs to be a steady income source. It, 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 it can't all be funded with grants, and I mean, it needs to be steady. So, anyway, but. As you uh, explored uh, why businesses are, they're part of this ecosystem, they can benefit from refugees, why there isn't a larger amount of support, or what it would take to get there? Yes, um, I think, so, so businesses until now may hire refugees and have refugees on staff, but I don't think they've been asked by the nonprofits to support them politically. There hasn't been that relationship. Um, just this week, I, I presented in Idaho talking to nonprofits about how to build relationships with businesses. I don't think they've asked. And so I think there's just this, this 
this gap between the nonprofits and the businesses, and if their relationship can be um, improved and um, um, just they can engage with each other, I think that that will, um, you know, businesses will understand that they do need to step up and, and help because I, I think people aren't connecting the dots. I think a lot of businesses probably who hire refugees just take the system for granted and they have no idea what's happening in refugee resettlement. And part of that has to do with the fact that journalism and newspapers um, are, are going the way of the dodo. Um, so, you know, people are t tunneling through cyberspace with blinders on and a lot of people just have no idea that refugee resettlement system is crumbling in this country. So, there's education that has to go on too. I was also a Pitch Fest finalist. These were much better. <laughs> um, uh, so in a moment, I'll give you uh, voting instructions, and uh, we'll stop uh, talking up here so you can submit your uh, votes. But uh, we want to be informed in our voting. And Dominic, Lola, Aaron, I'd love to hear from you. Um, uh, thank you for listening and asking such thoughtful questions. So I'm curious. What were you looking for in the system maps and the approaches that these fan finalists took to understanding the issue? Yeah, I think one thing um, I was looking for was, um, you know, it, it's kind of easy um, to jump to a solution, but it's much harder to really meaningfully um, do a, uh, a problem analysis or really scope out, okay, what are the drivers? Who are the, where's the, the power involved here? Um, what is keeping the status quo in place? You know, what kind of um, maybe perverse goals or um, cross purposes are we looking at here? You know, so what is, what's the lay of the land? And then from that, real um, meaningful understanding of the problem, does this, you know, can we devise a solution from there? So instead of saying, okay, here's my shiny solution, you know, let's trace it back to a problem, that's really easy. It's much more difficult to do an honest assessment of where we're at with a problem and be able to look for meaningful leverage points from there. So that's something I would... Yeah, I mean, I was really interested in how deeply they had started understanding the different actors um, in the realm that they're interested in working because no one does anything alone and it's important to know who your partners can be and what they offer and where the holes are in what they offer. Um, so I was curious about how much they had really uh, kind of mapped that immediate ecosystem around, around the, the local problem. Mm -hmm. And sometimes actors have different goals, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, Leslie, I was looking for uh, you know data, and was that driving them towards a path, or you know helping them avoid going to the solution that maybe was already in mind or potentially already obvious? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was apparent in all three presentations that they handled the, these things that you were looking for in different ways, right? Um, so I'm curious also what what you believe are the benefits, or even just describing what you think the role of the entrepreneur should or could be when connecting to various systems. And if, if you have a viewpoint on what the role of the entrepreneur is, what, can you give an example that you like? Great, great question. <laughs> um, I'm gonna talk from personal experience. Um, I come from the nonprofit world. I worked at EcoTrust and we worked a lot in the realm of global food systems and specifically farm to school, school food, and premium school food. And when I was in that space, I realized that I wanted to become an entrepreneur because there was opportunities to actually access all the resources that the nonprofits are offering. I think businesses don't always know that those are there, and nonprofits don't always know how to inspire entrepreneurs to access them. And so, you know. You can create as many resources as you want, but if an entrepreneur or a business person doesn't go out and take advantage of those, and that's why I always encourage entrepreneurs to look for as many partnerships as they can 
and really build relationships, uh, not just with other businesses, but with many people in different sectors. And I think that what's great is that entrepreneurs have the opportunity to um, you know, build really broad coalitions and tackle things very specifically, and they have constraints, and those constraints can be part of the benefit of what they're up to. Yeah, so something I heard in your example is seeing the opportunity, but also having the willingness to act on it and the, the energy, but also something I heard a lot in your example is conceptualizing it as bringing people together, right? That's how yeah. you saw the work. Yeah, and, and in my case, you know, we, I knew the Farm to School Network, and I said, I want to sell the schools. Mm -hmm. And because I understood that relationship, I was able to bring a product to the school food market. And now that I have, I can help other entrepreneurs navigate that system, awesome. right? Yeah, I, uh, I work with a lot of entrepreneurs, and what I see, very similar to what you were saying, is they're the person with a vision and can bring the team together and empower that team to go after a problem, um, but always usually vigilant and empowering their teams to notice the difference between you know, what their vision is and those gaps that exist because where they might want to go and what truly fits the market is usually a little bit to the left or right, um, and they take that advice from their team uh, and are willing to uh, bring a good team together and let that guy where they end up. The only thing I would add is um, about the role of the entrepreneur specifically is uh, to be as good of a listener and to um, to have an eye, you know, because I think the role of the entrepreneur to really successfully navigate that space between problem and solution, you have to truly listen to your players um, and uh, to be willing to change course and adapt as mm -hmm. needed. So those short feedbacks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I should be taking notes because being an entrepreneur isn't about what Instagram tells me about what outfits to wear. <laughs> I did not hear that in your responses. Um, so please take a moment to consider what you've heard from our advisors, from our uh, finalists, um, and uh, based on these insights, this is where you come in. Um, so on the screen behind me, there's a website, uh, www.menti.com, menti.com, and on that site, you will enter the code 5614-28. And uh, uh, when you enter those digits, then you get to select between our three finalists. So if you do not have a smart device with you today, or if you're having trouble connection, connecting, you can go to the registration booth during the lunch break and cast your vote by post-it. By post-it, low tech, low tech, I like it. So voting will be open until two o'clock today and is limited to elevating Impact Summit guests. Don't tweet, don't tweet. And for each of you, please only vote one time. And while we pause for you to check out the voting poll, I'd like to ask our finalists to come back out for a group photo. Give them one more round of applause.